If you guys are environmentalists like me, you've probably found yourself in a very familiar situation. You're talking with somebody about climate change or about something that's important, like marine pollution and plastics or how we need to get off of uh, fossil fuels. Just to have that conversation kind of go nowhere, be redirected, and you realize that everything that you were just saying to this person went in one ear and out the other and made no impact. And it can be kind of frustrating to see how indifferent most people are about these issues. And to me, this is so critical. So what's going on? Do these people just not care about the planet at all? Or maybe I've been doing something wrong this whole time. What I'd like to talk to you guys about today is a couple of rhetorical techniques and negotiation tactics that I've learned over the years that help to get through to people, my father in particular, and you can use these to get other people in your life to uh, contribute a little bit more in their own small ways to helping uh, to fight climate change or environmental destruction. Okay? Uh, as an environmental educator, my job involves talking to people of various cultural and age backgrounds about the ocean, about marine life, and the different forms of destruction that human activity is causing on these things. I'm a very passionate person, and I like to argue a lot. And if I think that I'm right about something, I tend to argue it until my bones go dry. And this might work for winning an argument if my only definition of winning was to prove to myself that I know what I'm talking about. But a lot of the time, this doesn't really end up with the other person changing their minds about anything. A much more humbling and difficult goal is getting the other person to see the, the light in a way and to get them to change their habits or change their mind about something. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. If you guys are uh, in your 20s or early teens or something like that, then you've probably spent your whole life hearing about climate change. Uh, you hear about uh, the earth is warming, the seas are filling with plastic, and species are going extinct faster and faster, faster than ever before. And you may have heard the news just this week that uh, the last male northern white rhino passed away, which basically means that's the end of the species as we know it. These problems are too dire, and our timeline is too short to just give up and say, well, we're never going to convince the older generations. They're too stubborn. We'll just have to wait until they're long gone. And then when we're in control, we'll be able to change everything. We'll be able to fix all these problems. That's not the right attitude to have. For one thing, these problems are happening right now. And we have to solve them as fast as possible. And our parents were, are still going to be around for another 30 to 40 years, God willing. The other thing is that though time might not be on our side, the facts are on our side. We, we are right on this issue. And we can bring them over to our side and get them to start participating in conservation activities if we could learn to convince them and reason with them on their level. And to do that, we have to change our message a little bit. So the good news is that people in their 20s do take these issues very seriously. Uh, we hear a lot about these things uh, on Facebook. And maybe you're not climate activists just yet, but at least our generation does understand these things to be fact. We know that climate change is real, and we see all these different things uh, in the headlines. But unfortunately, there's still a large percentage of people who don't even believe in climate change or that it's a problem at all. A recent study by Yale found that only 58% of Americans believe that climate change is mostly man-made. And even the president himself said that climate change is, and I quote, invented by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. Um, if that's true, I got a hand to the Chinese. They make a very convincing hoax. I don't know how to get through to these people. Unfortunately, when you've made up your mind on an issue like this, it's really, really hard to get people to change over. And if they do change their mind on this, it has to come from their own internal change of heart or epiphany. Nothing that I can say can really change their minds. But the vast majority of people are not made up on this issue. They can still change their mind. They're more or less in the middle. And we can access these people. They're a lot more within reach. We just need to learn how to actually communicate with them in a way that they'll listen. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. So I'm going to give you guys um, 
some little tips that I've picked up over the years of being an environmental educator and somebody who's very passionate about the environment. Uh, some different ways that you can change your message to actually be effective. Okay? So tip number one is don't push people to extremes, accept baby steps. Baby steps do help. Okay? So habits are very, very hard to change. I, for one, I really like the taste of meat and seafood. And I know it's not great for the environment to eat too much of it, but I indulge every now and then, even though I know the consequences. And I wish I can cut it out of my life entirely, but it is really hard, so I understand. There's a lot of people out there who have a lot more willpower, and they're able to just cut meat and seafood out of their life entirely. And I commend those people. Those are vegans, of course. But I think we've all come across one or two people who can be a little bit obnoxious about the vegan lifestyle. You may have heard the old joke, uh, how do you know if someone's a vegan? Don't worry, they'll tell you, right? And, and it is true, they'll, they can go on and on about the benefits of their lifestyle and how it's the least impactful diet for the environment. But even though it might come across as preachy, they're right, it's absolutely true. The vegan diet does uh, have the least harmful impacts on the environment, not to mention animal rights and things like that. But sometimes the messaging, the way that they come across, it just puts people off and then the, their movement doesn't really expand because they annoy people. And that's what I want to change. I want to change the way that we can actually engage people. Yeah, so that vegan could have had a lot more luck with convincing someone to just take uh, a different approach. Like instead of cutting meat out entirely, to say, I only eat red meat once a month. That's perfectly fine. Or I'm vegetarian at breakfast and at lunch, but then at dinner I eat whatever I want. Again, perfectly fine. Or uh, I'm not going to make any significant changes. I'll still eat the amount of seafood I want to eat, but no shark fin soup. I'm never eating that again. Again, it's totally fine. Any reduction in meat or any reduction in the food that we eat that is bad for the environment, any reduction is great. And our addiction to meat in its quantity right now is totally unsustainable. But the meat industry can actually be sustainable. We just all need to play a part in moderating our portions. Okay? Uh, another topic is marine plastics. So I work as a dive master in Southeast Asia here, and something that I see a lot is plastic and all kinds of rubbish either strewn on the beaches or embedded in otherwise pristine coral reefs. And naturally one of my pet issues is reducing uh, overall wasted plastic. And I can be pretty non-negotiable about this. So if I forget my reusable water bottle, and I can't find any drinking fountains, well then I'm out of luck because I, on principle, do not buy single-use plastic bottles. And I've full-on walked out of restaurants that only serve their food on polystyrene plates with plastic utensils. I just, I go eat somewhere else. Now I don't expect everyone to be this rigid on this issue, but what would be great is if everybody just made tiny little changes to their behavior or the things that they do to reduce plastic as much as possible. So, I would encourage people to just take the no straw pledge. So you go to a restaurant, you go to a bar, maybe when you're a little older, and then you say, oh, I'd like uh, this and that drink, a uh, virgin margarita, no straw, please. That's just what I say. Whenever I order a drink, no straw. And then that's, you know, it seems like a small thing, but really, plastic straws, how often do you drink one? And how often does it just go straight in the garbage? Every time. Over a whole year, that could be hundreds of drinking straws that you're now reducing from your life by just saying no straw. Or another thing that you could do is to buy one of these. It's a set of reusable uh, cutlery, right? So I just keep it in my backpack. You can keep it in your purse. And then you never have to accept the single-use alternative that other restaurants and things like that provide. Now, these are all great ways to reduce the amount of plastic that we produce because they're great for the planet. But it's easy to get people on board with this because it's cheap and it's really easy and convenient. And here's the genius part. If you can get someone to make just this small little change of going no straws or having them walk around with one of these in their purses, look how, ah, look how tiny it is. You know, it takes up no space. Once they make that change in their life, they're going to start to see all the other plastics in their lives that they wouldn't have thought about otherwise. And they're going to start making all of these like acknowledgments without you pushing them in every direction. They'll start to see the, uh, the grocery bags and the coffee cups and the wrapping 
and the packing peanuts and the packages and the stir sticks, everything. And you don't have to point all that stuff out to them because by making that one initial change, that first baby step, now they've taken the first step in becoming a more aware and socially responsible consumer. And that's what we're really going for. So don't you know, take these little baby steps for granted because they do snowball into people being a lot more active and aware of the world around them and how much we actually dump into the sea. So that's tip number one. Don't push people to the extremes. Just accept little baby steps and then maybe it'll blossom into something more in the future. Okay, tip number two. Provide solutions, don't just criticize. So I'll give you a scenario. You're going grocery shopping with your parents and you see mom and dad come out of the grocery store with all of their stuff in these plastic bags. Now, your first thought might be to criticize them and be disappointed and say, oh, why are you putting everything into these single-use bags? Don't you know it's all going to end up in the sea? It's going to choke a turtle or something terrible like that? And in the moment, you may have felt that you did the right thing. And oh, next time, they'll think twice before they take that plastic bag. But in reality, people don't respond that well to criticism like that. And they don't really take it to heart because they feel embarrassed. What you could do instead is to actually provide the solution that's workable. So you could either go and show them where they can get uh, non-disposable, uh, those tough bags, you know, the fabric ones that you can use over and over again, or you can get them that set of cutlery as a gift. You know, Just say to your friend, oh, here, take this. And then now you've provided them with the solution. So from my own life, I used to work at a resort where we served all of our drinks with plastic straws. And I went to the GM and I said, I don't think that we should be doing this anymore. Wouldn't it make more sense to not put plastic straws in our drinks because that's sending the wrong message? We should just cut that out of our practice. And he told me, that's a great idea, but I'm very busy. I don't really have the time to do this sort of thing. So if you want this to happen, if this means a lot to you, you have to go out and make it happen. And so I did. I contacted the purchasing department at the resort, and they understood once I explained to them why we shouldn't be using plastic straws, but they still needed to use straws of some sort. So I had them look into some paper straws, and there we have it. Now we use paper straws at that resort. And it's, it happened because it wasn't extra work for them. People are busy, they have their own lives, and often if they're not incredibly passionate about something, they're not gonna go out of their way to make some kind of change on behalf of the planet. But if you present them with that situation, with that solution, and you make it easy for them to make the change, then they're a lot more likely to take it on. All right. Tip number three. Tip number three is, um, find a way for your interests, or in this case, the planet's interests, to align with theirs. Okay. So um, a lot of these eco-friendly, green, non-GMO products that you see they're very well marketed, but they can also be really expensive. And things like this have led people, like my dad in particular, to see these products as a clever marketing campaign to get young people to spend more money on these products. And in a way, sometimes that is true, but it doesn't have to be the case. A lot of green changes in your life actually don't cost anything or, in fact, save you some money. My plastic water bottle, well, it's a reusable plastic water bottle, cost about $8. How much does a single-use bottle from the, the vending machine cost? A dollar? Two dollars? How many times are you going to buy one over the course of a week or a month? That's going to add up. So I actually save a lot of money by having a reusable bottle. I just have to remember to bring it. Okay? And you can be creative in all these different ways because it doesn't just have to be financial. Um, think about uh, Elon Musk. He understands this. How quickly are these electric cars going to take off once people realize how much money they'll save on gasoline once you can just plug your car in overnight and then you can drive it the next day? Okay. It would be nice if everybody would make these changes in their life altruistically, but the truth is we all have our own interests, and if you can find a way for their interests to line up with something good, like reducing their fuel consumption or plastic production or things like that, then you know, they're much more likely to carry out that change. And number four, and this is an important one, walk the walk, okay? If you're passionate enough about something to actually devote time and energy to it, like volunteering or making changes in your own life that are kind of difficult, 
your family and your peers will respect you for it and will take that issue a lot more seriously rather than just thinking it's some youthful fancy and you'll get over it in a year. Okay? Um, so an example is if your family's having a party or a barbecue and they buy a whole bunch of plastic plates and cutlery for the event and they say, oh, we well, just don't want to have to deal with all the dishware because this is easier. We'll just throw everything out afterwards. What you could do is say, no, 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 I insist. Just use the normal plates and everything, and I'll do the dishes afterwards. Now, you're putting in the extra work, and you're making their life easier. But it shows that you're willing to put yourself out there to actually make a change in the world, even if it's just for one small little event. You, know, you can't say, oh, man, cars are polluting the air, and we need to stop using them. And then you turn around and drive your car everywhere. Right? That's not a very good role model behavior. You want to role model the things that you want to see uh, in the world, and people are a lot more likely to follow you in that. Um, a 2016 study here in Singapore found that 9 in 10 people are concerned about the effects of climate change on future generations. And yet only 1 in 3 actually believe that their individual actions will have an effect on that. This needs to change. We can't just rely on our governments to save us from ourselves. We have to push past our complacency. We have to be the ones who demand this sort of change, and it has to come from our own selves. And we need allies in this fight, too. It can't just be the young people. We need people of all different backgrounds and ages in the fight with us. Okay? So let's talk about these four tips that I've gone over. Okay? Number one, don't push people to extremes. Accept baby steps, because they are helpful. Number two, provide solutions, not just criticism. Three. Find a way for your interests or the planet's interests to align with that of the person you're speaking to. And four, walk the walk. The examples that I've used in this talk do have a lot more to do with the climate or environment and things like that. But the heart of what I'm saying can be applied to any situation where you're trying to be a little bit more persuasive in the way that you talk. Okay? The, the situation is really serious, but we are right on this. We do have the facts to back up what we're saying. And the time to act is now. But we need allies in this cause with us. Okay? So get out there and start bringing people into the fold of being climate activists. But always remember that being right on something isn't the only thing that's going to get someone to agree with you. You have to think about your presentation as well and your delivery. And always remember that the way you say something can lead to people being um, stubborn or you know, defensive. But it can just as easily invoke open-mindedness and inspiration to make change. Thank you very much.